Hello guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome back to the Trans Atheist. My name is Ariane. I am your host. So this is the second episode um, in the series, just kind of getting started out. Um, in the last one, we kind of talked about pride. I did fail to introduce myself, and um, I wanted to do that and get a little bit of my background story because obviously there are two parts to the title of the show, the first being trans, as I am a transgender woman in my, well, late 30s turning 40. Uh, the second part was atheist, and um, as, as a non-believer who came from a believing background, I kind of wanted to talk just a little bit about how we got there and what that means for me personally and, um, you know, what that can mean for others, although you know, atheist is a pretty large umbrella term, and it covers a vast amount of people. So, I grew up in a small southern town, and religion was a very important part of that. In the area that I grew up in, the most prominent religious group was Pentecostals. Um, now, there are a lot of branches in Pentecostalism. Um, obviously, you have the Oneness Pentecostals, which we had some of those. That is not what we were. Uh, then you have the non-denominational Pentecostals. Um, so, when I'm speaking of Pentecostal in my personal upbringing, I'm talking about that non-denominational church. Um, you know, the whole deal, speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit, all of those types of things were a very regular part of my upbringing. I can remember time frames when we had, for example, um, revivals that lasted for months. I mean, literally there, seven days a week, go to school, get out of school, go to church, be there until really late in the night, because let me assure you, if you come from like a liturgical background, like say Catholic or Presbyterian or something along those lines, um, Pentecostal churches, non-denominational churches, um, they tend to go quite a bit longer. So ours would be like 10, 11 o'clock even in some cases at night before we would be heading home and then you know, going back to school the next day, I would do homework in the car on the way to church. I would do homework while I was sitting in the pew at church. So it was a very important aspect um, of my life. When I got a little older in my teenage years, my parents actually ended up divorcing, and that led to them kind of falling out of the church, and I went through a lot of um, what I guess people from that background would call like a, a spiritual rebellion, if you want to say. Um, I studied a lot of different things from, um, you know, New Age religions to Hinduism to a certain amount of Islam, although I didn't spend quite as much time on that, to be honest. Um, a lot of it was more focused on the New Age um, and then as I, uh, and, and then also, you know, with the Jewish roots of my family and going back to that, um, so that was an important aspect, going to synagogue, etc. Um, and it was a little later that I ended up finding myself right back in the Pentecostal church. And again, a non-denominational church, not the one that I grew up in by any stretch of the imagination. But still the same, same type of belief systems with speaking in tongues and interpretation and the gifts of the Spirit. And we can go over those at another time. Um, and, you know, I kind of grew up in that family where both of my parents were Sunday school teachers. So just being what I used to call a pew warmer, it just wasn't in my blood, even though my, my parents were no longer involved in church. I wasn't the type of person who was going to be content to just sit there and keep a pew warm. So slowly over time, I started getting more involved. I started helping with the children's ministry. Um, I started doing like supplies. I was at a very large, um, for the area of what would have been considered a mega church at the time. Um, so I did like Sunday school supplies where we would, you know, the teachers would put in what they needed and we had a big, huge supply room. Well, a decent sized supply room 
where I would go gather things up. They had totes for their class, deliver, got involved in that. Eventually, I moved churches and um, got pretty involved there. I started out as an assistant with the children's minister and involved in puppet ministry, um, which actually was really, I enjoyed it, honestly, when it came to like the puppet ministry. That was kind of a fun thing to do, and it was entertaining for the kids. Um, eventually, I ended up launching my own ministry at the church, a tweens ministry for those kids that were kind of moving out of the younger classes, but not quite ready to move into youth. Um, and I would do those. Uh, I taught that on Wednesday nights um, and kind of served as an assistant to that children's pastor over the years. Um, so... Kind of moving forward, uh, we had a bit of a family issue um, with with someone in my family who was uh, struggling with some health concerns. I was taking care uh, of that and ultimately lost them. And through all these years, I had known that there was something very, very different uh, about me from at least how other people were seeing it. I didn't seem to, to blend in with what the typical quote-unquote male uh, Christian or even non-Christian in the community was. Uh, I knew that that didn't really match who I was. I mean, some of my youngest memories, I, I still remember as a child having shaggier hair and then having my family secretly like waited till I fell asleep and cut, cut my hair because I would throw such a fit as a small child about the idea of having my hair cut. I mean, talk about a Samson and Delilah story. There was one for you right there. Um, and I remember waking up from that and being in tears and telling, um, you know, my family at the time, I'm not pretty anymore. And that was um, kind of a hard thing for me, but it also was kind of, uh, even as a child, it was a wake-up call that how I see myself, the people around me don't see that as okay. So, um, dealing with the Pentecostal upbringing, you know, I, I didn't have a word for transgender growing up. I just knew that I related considerably more to the girls than I did the boys. I never had any close friends who were guys. I was just unable to do that. It was too awkward. Uh, you hear fireworks in the background. Sorry about that. But, um... So throughout that time frame, I knew something was different. I did a lot to push that down. Eventually, I had seen an interview with Jazz Jennings when she was just a little thing. Um, and it scared the hell out of me because I saw myself in it. And I also knew that the community that I was in, both my actual community, like my town, as well as like the church community that was my social, social structure, that that was not going to be something that was even close to being acceptable. So I really pushed that down, and it was really, really tearing at me for a lot of years. So eventually I decided I was going to move away and put some distance between myself and all those people who had known me my entire life. And I wanted to kind of figure things out. You know, I was one of those people who I did take my faith seriously, so if who I was was in conflict with my faith, then I wanted to be honest about that. So I spent some time studying and working through all of that, and it wasn't an easy thing necessarily, but ultimately um, by doing that, by exposing myself to people who thought differently than I did, um, you know, looking at some, listening to some atheist speakers and some, you know, I, I listened to people from different religions as well as people from different sects within um, Christianity. And through all that trying to fit who I was with the Bible, I kind of came to a, a, a conclusion eventually of why why am I trying to make all of this fit into this biblical text when I can't find any good reason to believe that this biblical text is authoritative? I mean, I looked at things like the Genesis account, and that doesn't match up with anything that we've been able to scientifically prove. 
Um, I thought about personal experience because that was always a strong part. Well, you know, I've had these various um, what I thought were personal experiences, but then it's like, how did I know that that was a personal experience, quote unquote, with God? How did I know that was not just any other feeling that a person has? And honestly, what I came down to was I thought it was a quote unquote personal experience with, with a deity because that's what I had been told it was. But I didn't have any good reason to believe that was the truth. And the more that I looked at it, the more I realized that I didn't have any good reasons for believing in this creator God that I had been taught. And I couldn't come up with a reason why I should believe in any others either. Um, there was nothing you know, proving that point. There was no compelling evidence that way. Everything I looked at seemed to support the idea of a complete and totally natural world. Um, so it still took a while before I could really say the title atheist because I wasn't saying there was no God. I was just saying that I'm not convinced and I had always thought that being an atheist meant that you were hardcore, there is no God. And it wasn't until later that I found that, that that really doesn't make any sense. You know, theist is someone who believes in a God. Atheist is someone who doesn't. Now, an atheist can also be someone who actively does not believe in a God, or someone who's simply not convinced, which is the category I would put myself in for the most part. Um, in some cases, there are certain gods that I'm pretty thoroughly convinced do not exist. You know, I mean, if we look at things like Thor and, and you know, Poseidon, and I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty thoroughly convinced those don't exist. I would go so far as to, you know, say with a lot of these religions. But I'm not saying there is no possibility. I'm saying that I don't see one, and with the null hypothesis, I'm going to go with there's none until I'm proven, till something is proven to be there. So that's kind of a little bit about how I got where I am at this point. Um, I would say that, you know, it's like, do I have a problem, quote, unquote, a problem with religion, so to speak? And, and, and to a degree, yes, I guess. I mean, I have a problem with believing things that you have no good reason to believe. But it probably wouldn't bother me nearly as much if religious people weren't using their views, their, their doctrine, their dogma to color the way that they're involved in society from their voting, uh, from, you know, the way that they treat one another. You know, if it was just a personal view that you held, that you lived your life by, that probably wouldn't bother me all that much. I mean, I still wouldn't be thrilled that you believe something on faulty, in my opinion, faulty evidence, but I could deal with that. What I have a problem with, though, is we see it right now that Christians are the ones that push for almost, I mean, what I would call a theocratic move in the country. They want their religion in the classroom. They want to teach creationism, which is not a science. There's no no scientific evidence for it. They want to go after trans people like myself, and they want to put that into law. They, they fought marriage equality, and they're fighting now to overturn it. They fought against a woman's right to choose, and now they have kind of won that battle due to having a Supreme Court that's packed with religious fundamentalists. And, you know, in all of that, that makes me not so warm to the idea of religion. You know, a religion, and, and I get it, because if it were true, it would have to color your perspective of life, I would imagine. But there's no good reason to believe it's true. So that's kind of the background on where I'm coming from, uh, on how I see things and, and how I've gotten here. Um, it's still a learning process. It's still a moving process. I'm open to evidence when people can present it, but I don't see a lot of people presenting evidence. I see a lot of people presenting anecdotes and 
and blind faith and I'm just not interested in blind faith. You know, and as far as the world around me, when I look at things and I've heard people talk about how hopeless it must feel, you know, to be an atheist, to be a non-believer. And, you know, I once believed that myself, if you'd have asked me, you know, back when I was, you know, a Pentecostal Christian, I would have thought that an atheist must be a miserable person. But I'm not. You know, I look at the world around me and I'm fascinated by everything that we that we have and everything that we discover. You know, the idea of, you know, people saying, well, you know, just making, believing in evolution and just thinking that we're just animals. Well, you know, we are animals. And I don't find that at all a horrible thing. I think it's absolutely beautiful to know that I share this common ancestry with every living creature on the planet. Maybe if we felt that way, maybe if we understood that when we're looking at that animal, that, you know, that, that we are looking at something that is related to us, something that, that had its start in the same place as us, that in its own weird little way, we are part of a family of creatures, everything ranging from humans and orangutans to the tiniest single-celled organism. Perhaps we would have a little bit more appreciation for this world, this galaxy, this universe, and whatever is beyond that, um, that surrounds us. You know, maybe we wouldn't see this the way a lot of Christians do, as just kind of a testing ground where you wipe your feet of it and move on to the real life that's the afterlife. You know, something that you have no proof of. You know, I only know of the one life I get. And I'm fascinated by it. I'm never going to learn it all in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to see it all learned in this lifetime. But, mm-hmm. but it's fascinating what we can see along the way with with evolution and with black holes and the understanding of how galaxies are formed and and what could be out there. I don't find that boring. I don't find that hopeless. In fact, I find that to be a very powerful hope. Because unlike the hope in religion, that hope has evidence. I have evidence on the common ancestry of animal species on this planet. I have evidence of galaxies and how they form. And there's a real possibility, you know, that maybe somewhere out there some galaxy could form that could sustain a different type of life. I don't know that that's the case. I don't know that it's not. It's not changing my worldview. But it's fascinating to see what can happen? And that is a long cry from hopelessness. I think that it's actually just amazing to think about. So anyway, that is the long view of how I feel, uh, how I got here. If you have any questions or comments or things that you would like for you know me to talk about in upcoming podcasts, then please feel free to comment, shoot me an email, whatever you need to do. Uh, There's information, you know, on both the YouTube page. I think you can comment on Spreaker. I'm not really sure how all that works. I know we're also on some other platforms just getting started. Feel free to share this from whatever platform you're listening. And um, until the next podcast, my name is Ariane, and I hope you have a great day. And thanks for listening to The Trans Atheist. Bye-bye.